Welcome to our snow day lecture. I'm going to make two recordings today. I set my, just set my time for, for 45 minutes. I'm going to make two 45 minute recordings. It's longer than our normal class meeting, but last week, our last class meeting was a snow day and I made a shorter version of our uh, class meeting then. So two 45 minute lectures uh, today. And so here we are this week. Um, uh, Riley was going to come in today, was scheduled to come in today. Uh, he's going to come in next week. Uh, this week we want to read, completely read, and bring questions in about chapter 17. Our first exam is next week on Thursday, and it must be Thursday the 9th, and uh, it'll include chapter 17 and everything up to that point. And um, so next Tuesday we'll hear from Riley, and then we'll uh, you know take care of business that uh, you know questions and getting ready for the exam on uh, the week from Thursday. Okay, uh, this week on Thursday um, after our class, but after our class, a graduate student here, Kevin, who did his uh, undergrad here as well a couple of years ago, uh, is giving a short talk, just a very short talk, and uh, it'd be nice to go and uh, listen to what Kevin's up to. It's very different than our course. It's about uh, uh, zooplankton, uh, little organisms in the uh, marine settings that are, you know, the bottom of the food chain, like that. Okay, so um, we're still wrapping up Chapter 9. I have a couple more things to say about that, uh, following up on uh, last week's Snow Day lecture. And so, um, you know, we've seen this before. Uh, we got a chunk of Chapter 9 we dealt with from Day 1 on uh, gene uh, or organization of genes of the DNA and physical DNA and uh, transcription and then new stuff here and then uh, on the snow day lecture last week I was dealing with these different methods just as a kind of introduction to how to study transcription factors and the regulatory reaches they bind to and so there's our clay model then there's this where we drove through here to talk about different ways that um, transcription factors regulate rate limiting step. And in doing that, we learned about that story, but then we learned a lot about each of these transcription factors, especially the estrogen receptor. And um, um, in learning about the heat shock transcription factor, we learned about the uh, GAGA factor that helps with nucleosome phasing. And so in the context of this second um, story, remodel chromatin, we have these three th different pieces. The one is DNA methylation that we've talked about uh, before in our course and is in the clay model videos at the start of our course. And then histone acetylation, which is how the um, uh, nuclear receptors and other, tran other transcription factors regulate um, uh, transcription and then just a little uh, bit of that with the uh, GAGA factor and nucleosome phasing with that. Okay, so here's just that image of GAGA factor. It's bound already. It's bound in all of our cells right now in the uh, heat shock genes and it is keeping the region open so that if there is any stress, heat shock transcription factor trimerizes and can immediately bind to the heat shock elements, the response elements, the enhancer upstream of all, every heat shock gene and rapidly activate it by releasing an arrested polymerase. Okay, so here are the five methods, and I talked about the first three in the last lecture, so I'm gonna talk about affinity purification and, and uh, CHIP, or chromatin immunoprecipitation assay. And all of these are, you just kind of have to back up and say, well, what if we didn't know very much about a particular transcription factor? And we're especially using the estin receptor as our example to learn about these methods and the estin receptor target gene, Vitelligen, just as an example. And scientists know a ton about that. And uh, But all these learning has happened really in the last, say, 30 years. Yep. And uh, so Vitelligen has an ERE, an estrogen response element, an enhancer that's going to activate it. The estrogen receptor binds to it. It's a ligand bound, uh, ligand um, dependent transcription factor, and it's going to affect uh, chromatin structure by uh, when the hormone's present, it's going to bind to histone acetylase and acetylate all the histones and get them to unfold into euchromatin or open chromatin transcriptionally uh, available, like that. So just talking through this, next one is the affinity purification. So these first three are about identifying how to identify a um, enhancer, DNA. And the next one is, okay, so how, what do we do? You know, we've got the enhancer, but and we've seen evidence from nuclease, nuclease footprinting and gel mobility shift that a protein binds. But what protein? 
And so this affinity purification is uh, uh, one way that uh, scientists would traditionally identify that protein. And uh, it uh, goes like this, where uh, there are some beads, and so just insoluble porous beads, and uh, they can put in to be put in this tube, and this tube has a mesh at the bottom, so liquid can flow through, but the beads cannot. And uh, the beads, before they're put in the tube, uh, get uh, bound to them, uh, DNA, little pieces of DNA, and it's the enhancer DNA that we're interested in. And so it's a very simple idea that these beads are going to have the DNA, and they're said to be immobilized. The DNA is immobilized. It's not moving, and we can pass liquid through them. And we can pass a cell extract. We can break open cells. We can purify the nuclei, and they would break open the nuclei. And we can send all the proteins in the nucleus across the beads, and uh, most of the proteins will pass through, and that's just called the flow through. And then our proteins of interest, the protein of interest like the um, estrogen receptor, if we have an estrogen response element DNA here, the estrogen receptor will stick, and then we can keep wash, 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 wash off extra, and then we can do some shift in um, the liquids, um, you know, material in the liquids, uh, to cause the protein to be released. Um, here it says at, at a high salt buffer. Uh, another thing scientists do is they just shift the pH, and so that causes the protein to temporarily, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, fold differently like that. And we want to get it off that column, and that's called eluding it. When we elute, and I'll just say when we elute, the material, uh, we want to collect that. So we collect that sample and we have our purified uh, estrogen response element, or I mean estrogen receptor, and do, we can study it. We now have that protein and we can study it. And so this is just one oh, traditional way, and our book talks about it in this chapter, and it's a satisfying story to see how scientists could get a hold of these proteins. Then the last method is this CHIP method, uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation assay. The book talks about it. And um, here's the figure where the book talks about it. And uh, the strategy here is that we're interested in this green protein. Let's say that it's the estrogen receptor. And in this case, we say, okay, so where we're at is we studied vitelligenin. I always forget how many L's and O's, uh, L's and T's are on vitelligenin uh, as a as a response gene, target gene for estrogen. So we add some estrogen, it starts making um, uh, different responses, cells start making respond, including making the yolk proteins, and that's vitelligenin, we look at the gene, we map uh, through um, deletion studies and footprinting, nuclease protection studies, and um, um, uh, gel shift, mobility shift assays. We identify where the enhancer is. We use the enhancer to identify the protein. And we're like, okay, we see this binding to this. And so chromatin immunoprecipitation assay helps us identify uh, what are all the targets? What are all the estrogen response genes? Not just vitelligenin, but what are all of them? And of course, we could do that uh, with any. And the way we do that is we first have to prepare an antibody, and the antibodies are made by our immune system. There are proteins that stick with high affinity to specific molecules, and we have to create an antibody in a host animal, like a rabbit or a mouse, and we inject some estrogen receptor into the animal. It recognizes it as being foreign, and it attacks it with its immune system, including making antibodies. So we have an antibody that will stick to this, and uh, the antibodies are depicted here as like a little upside down letter Y, because uh, they sort of have that shape. They have that shape, uh, basic shape, uh, structurally. And so here it just says, okay, there are some different transcription factors. I see a blue one, I see a red one, and they're bound to their response genes. Here's the estrogen receptor, and it would be bound to the vitelligenin gene. And then it would be bound to other target genes as well. And there are a bunch of them. And uh, we want to identify them all. And so the strategy is this. We start out with cells, and we add a what's called a cross-linking agent. 
The cross-linking agent is a molecule that's chemically reactive. In this case, it's formaldehyde. And formaldehyde is a preservative I'm sure you've heard of before, and it's preservative by being a cross-linking agent. It makes covalent bonds between random molecules. <coughs> it can make them between proteins and proteins, or proteins and DNA, and so forth. And so uh, we add some formaldehyde, we form some covalent, physical covalent crosslinks between random proteins and the DNA. And uh, then we break the cells open, and we break them open in the presence of detergents, in the presence of soaps and other molecules that just cause everything to denature and get spread out in the tube and be dissolved in the tube. And so now we have some pieces of DNA that have proteins covalently bonded to them because of the formaldehyde cross-linking, and the detergent can't separate them like that. So the DNA is extracted with these crossing proteins. The DNA gets sheared, uh, broken up into smaller pieces, and then we use this antibody to pull out the estrogen receptor. And in pulling out the estrogen receptor, we pull out all the DNA, all the enhancers that the estrogen receptor is bound to. And that would be for all the genes, whether it's, and it would include vitellogenin and, and every other gene. <coughs> and then the crosslinks can be reversed uh, by just heating the sample in this case, and these uh, DNAs can be analyzed. And we can sequence the DNA and identify every gene that's regulated by estrogen because uh, it's the estrogen receptor that we've been studying. And so that's a really good example of CHIP, and CHIP is a really powerful technique, and one example is to identify all of the response elements, all, all of the response um, genes, or target genes, the estrogen receptor. Here's another thing, is that we get to identify all of the response elements that this protein binds to, whether it's the estrogen receptor or some other transcription factor. And when scientists look at the enhancers, they see that <coughs> genes have a little, some different sequences in enhancers. So the estrogen receptor doesn't bind to just one specific sequence. It binds to a set of sequences, and that's shown here. So um, this is like an averaging. And in this case, it's the, it shows the uh, testosterone response element. Uh, testosterone uh, is typically called androgen. And it shows these letters, and it shows the DNA sequence letters, A, G, C, T. And the size of the letters indicates how important this position, this letter in this position is. So you see some very big letters, and what that says is that in all of the, est uh, of the uh, testosterone response genes, and all of them, they have a response element that's this long, and it like always has these letters in these positions. Then in some of the other positions, it has uh, this letter some of the time. And then in other positions, like here and here, there needs to be a letter, but it doesn't matter which letter it is. And what that's mapping is what's called a consensus sequence, and it represents the average as all the sequence where the testosterone receptor binds. And that's important as part of understanding how to identify uh, response elements, you know, when we are studying new genes like that. And so CHIP helps us to do that. So we have uh, the functions for CHIP. One is to identify all the um, response, element, uh, response genes. Then two, uh, characterize the consensus sequence for the response element, the enhancer for that transcription factor. And then another thing that scientists used is they originally used the uh, CHIP and this is actually how CHIP was uh, first used, is they use it to study the arrested polymerase. So they have an antibody to RNA polymerase, and they're like, oh, look, this gene isn't even acted, but it already has arrested polymerase on it. And then they can activate the gene, and they can see the polymerase on different positions along the length of the gene. And then another one, just because we've talked about it, is they, they can use it to study other transcription factors. Like, think about this tata binding protein. And remember, the heat chuck or the myo-D binds to the tata binding protein. 
And so if we were studying tau to binding protein and we had an antibody to it, what we would find is that the tau to binding protein is not present on the myogenin gene in the absence of myOD because it's the right limiting step. And so we could show chip, and chip would not pull this sequence down because there's no tau to binding protein to pull the sequence down. Then, when myOD gets activated, we find myOD delivers TBP, and now the antibody will bind to the promoter, uh, the, t the tau to binding sequence of the promoter, the myogenic gene, and activate, help activate the gene. And so now, if we use an antibody, we'll pull this down. Remember, we also learned that TBP initially helps myOD bind to the myogenin enhancer, and then the myOD helps TBP bind to the promoter. So that's one way scientists discovered this role, uh, kind of dual role of TBP, because they saw it bound here, and they also detected it present on the enhancer because the formaldehyde cross-linked the myOD protein to the myogenin enhancer, and it also cross-linked the TBP protein to uh, the myOD transcription factor. So that's a fourth example of uh, uh, the role of chromatin immunoprecipitation. And so the question on the exam could be, what is chromatin immunoprecipitation used for? Give me three examples or two examples like that. And so these are some different ways that uh, uh, chromatin and immunoprecipitation assay is used. Chip, okay, great. And so those are our five um, stories of different methods that are used, and uh, they help us, you know, further appreciate. Wow, this is really a physical story, like that. All right. And so this is just looping back, right? The three big pieces of uh, chapter nine are the clay model videos then the major ways to regulate the rate limiting step in transcription that transcription factors do and then some methods used uh, to study regulatory regions and uh, transcription vectors that bind to it great so that's the end of chapter nine and uh, there could be questions for that and uh, or anywhere else that we've covered as we start getting ready for our exam uh, now we're going to move on to chapter 17 and we already know a lot of chapter 17 in chapter 17, uh, we can also start to appreciate here is the actual, the big picture that we're trying to learn in our course. And one of it is regulation of gene expression, especially regulation of transcription. So we've been learning about that. We'll continue to learn about that. Just think about the time we spent talking about transcription and transcription factors. We're going to talk about them a lot more. So, but that's one of three. The second is this chapter 17 topic. So I want to emphasize that this is uh, chapter 17 is one of the big three chapters. And look, after our first exam, uh, the other of the big three chapters is chapter 18, regulation of the cell cycle. And so these are, are, are going to be our three big major topics in our course. And I'm just showing that just to emphasize the significance of our work. Uh, you know, on the first exam, there's going to be lots of our two main chapters main topic, and we've learned a lot about chapter 17 topics already, uh, but we need to learn a lot more now in this chapter, so we need to get that going. And so what we've learned about is we've learned that one category of uh, receptors uh, in animals are called receptor tyrosine kinases, and in humans there are 15 different ones, and there's one that we know a lot about. And we've said that we're going to learn just about a couple of these, and one of them is PDGF. And so there's a figure we've shown several times, and this is a Chapter 17 story. We've got PDGF, we've got the PDGF receptor, we've got RAS, RAF, MEK, ERK, ELK. Like that. We've also learned that this pathway can sometimes, instead of activating ELK, it can activate MYC. MYC is a transcriptive factor that regulates a cell cycle. And uh, so uh, we've learned a lot about uh, this pathway and how it leads to transcription and regulation of the cell cycle. So this story uh, fits all of these. See that? So this is an important example for us, just one of several. Now, this is one of the uh, receptor tyrosine kinases.
And this is one thing the receptor tyrosine kinases do, is they activate the RAS pathway. And one thing that leads to is changing transcription, and the, one of that things leads to is changing the cell cycle, stimulating the cell cycle. So I've shown this before. Here's the story for the um, PDGF signaling pathway. And we have that example where the woman had a translocation, chromosomal translocation, and got skin cancer because she was uh, expressing PDGF in the skin. Okay, like that. So we already know a lot about the receptor tyrosine kinases. And, uh, and we know about them because we have learned about PDGF, we've learned about RAS, and uh, we've learned some about MYC. And um, uh, the uh, ERB B and KIT are other receptor tyrosine kinases that we'll learn a little bit about. And I don't think we'll learn about KIT until after the first exam, but we'll learn something about ERB B before the first exam. Um, ERB B was one of the re retroviral oncogenes that uh, was studied uh, you know, back in the 1970s. ERB B is also uh, uh, now often called the epidermal growth factor receptor um, um, because that's its normal function. And so we've got these. There's the epidermal growth factor receptor. So ERB B is on this list. PDGF, the insulin receptors. And uh, so lots of different receptors with different roles in the cells. We'll especially focus on these receptors that bind to growth factors that stimulate the cell cycle and cell growth. So we're going to start making a list of receptors from Chapter 17. And uh, we know about nuclear receptors, and our favorite example is the estrogen receptor. We know about receptor tyrosine kinases because of PDGF receptor, and we'll learn about these others. Um, and then the chapter 17 includes explanation of G-protein couplers receptors. And then it pr provides this really like brief but important one section uh, uh, explanation of, um, sorry, this is a typo, non-receptor tyrosine kinases. And uh, we just have one example of that. And then some other unique receptors, um, Wnt, Notch, and TGDF beta receptors. And each of those has a figure and a, um, a disc an, an explanation uh, in a section like that, okay? So uh, it's possible to draw these all out and one big figure, or to draw the same figure and focus on one at a time. So I'm just gonna do that for you here. And the way you do the big drawing is you'd say, oop, you'd say, all right, here's the cell membrane. Okay. And, um, and um, here's the nucleus. That. Okay. So we're going to learn about nuclear receptors, like the estrogen receptor. There it is. See, and it's a physical different place, right? It's a transcription factor, so it's a transcription vector story. All the rest of the receptors in Chapter 17 and receptors in general are out here as transmembrane proteins. So here uh, is our example of uh, receptor tyrosine kinase. And, uh, for example, PDGF receptor. <laughs> And so we'll learn about that, okay? And in learning about it, uh, we learned about uh, RAS as a, a signal transduction pathway, right? So PDGF and some of the other receptor tyrosine kinases work via RAS. Then we also learned that um, the target of this pathway could be the transcription factor ELK or it could be the transcription factor MYC, like that. Okay, so very visual, right? These guys are gonna go into the, when activated, they go into the cell nucleus and regulate transcription 
and all of them are going to stimulate the cell cycle. So we're going to stimulate cell growth. Um, and uh, we've learned about this pathway for signal transduction. And in chapter 17, we're going to learn about another one. And uh, um, a another signaling pathway that leads to cellular responses. And in this, we're going to learn about another one that um, is um, not in our book anymore. It was in a previous edition, and I have the figure, and we'll learn a little bit about that. So with the receptor tyrosine kinases, we have our favorite receptors of the few of the 58, and they act through some different signal transduction pathways. And so we're going to learn a lot about these guys. And uh, when we'll get to it. Then um, there's another very famous, very important uh, set of receptors that are called G protein coupled receptors. And we're going to learn about them, and we're going to learn about uh, two pathways, two signaling pathways. One of them is going to lead to the activation of um, a protein called CREB, and that's a transcriptive factor. And then we're just going to learn also about another signal transduction pathway for different G protein coupled receptors. In our body, there are hundreds and hundreds of G protein coupled receptors. So that's a really important category, but we won't learn as much about it because we're really using uh, this uh, receptor tyrosine kinase story to learn the most in our course. And that's because the stories fit together so much with regard to cancer, because so much of these pathways include stimulating the cell cycle, right? And our favorite things are regulation of gene expression and per receptor signaling and signal transduction and regulation of the cell cycle. So this is gonna be our favorite. And then this is probably more significant in our normal health like that, G protein cup receptors. And uh, so we'll learn about that. Then we'll learn about some individual, just isolated examples of receptors. And uh, one of them is called a non-receptor tyrosine kinase. And the, our example for that is going to be called JAK stat. And it just, it's in a different fa uh, category like that. And so there's a figure and a section in a book about that. And um, it's going to activate a transcription vector uh, called STAT. So we'll learn about that pathway and how that can regulate um, transcription. And remember, we have a list of transcription vectors and how are they dynamic? Well, STATs are dynamic because they get phosphorylated by JAK kinase. So, you know, there's really not much new here the really important pathway in our health, but it was going to fit together. JAK itself is a tyrosine kinase, so it's got that activity, and it binds to a receptor. So it's not itself a receptor tyrosine kinase, it just binds to a receptor, and when activated, JAK phosphorylates STAT. So, you know, we'll get there. These are later in the, in the chapter, and we just have individual ones of that. So then here's another one, and um, here the signaling molecule is called WINT. And it binds to a receptor, and that receptor is going to stabilize a protein called beta-catenin. And beta-catenin is a transcription factor. So just another simple story. Uh, Wnt is very famous in uh, all over animal biology. Um, 
every animal on our planet uses a lot of wind signaling to regulate all kinds of stuff. So we'll learn about wind signaling because it's just profoundly important, even though the story of it is simple. And again, you know, we'll have a signaling molecule, a receptor, a signal transduction pathway, and then uh, a transcription factor that's, uh, you know, somehow, in this case, stabilized so it can do its job and bind to uh, target genes that get activated by wind. Then we have another one that we want to learn about, and that one is called Notch. And um, uh, Notch is the receptor. A molecule binds to Notch. And in the case of Notch, part of the Notch protein actually gets clipped off and floats into the cell and becomes a transcription factor. And Notch is another one that is just very famous, very often used. And then the last one we're going to look at will be uh, receptors that bind uh, to proteins that are in this family of, re of molecules called TGF beta. And uh, it's a bunch of different signaling molecules, and they bind to this receptor. The receptor is just called type 1, type 2 receptor, and it signals by uh, adding phosphates to some transcription factors called SMAD. So there you go. That's chapter 17 in a visual nutshell. And remember, I said, look, it's a list. But, you know, that list, hard to, you know, memorize. Much easier to learn by making a big drawing and, and, and making multiple, you know, different drawings. They, are, they all fit in that. But, you know, if you have some nice colored markers, you can make one big drawing, you know, tape together four pieces of paper, and then you could draw on it, stuff like that. But then also, remember, you could make uh, flashcards to fit, right? Oh, it's your elk flashcard, and it has a little information about what is elk, right? It's protein, it's transcription factor, it's a transcription factor activated by phosphorylation. It's activated by phosphorylation in the RAS signal transduction pathway, and, uh, and so elk gets activated when there is a signaling molecule like PDGF. Okay? So that's a summary of the chapter. It just puts all this together. And we already know a lot about certain parts of it. And because we know about those parts, we can visualize. Ah, oh, I see what's going on here. I see what's going on. You know, we have a kind of a lot of learning to do over here on the left about the different details. But then over the right, it's like, oh, cute. You know, notch signaling pathway. Really important biologically in our health and development. You know, when we're little embryos and fetuses growing, uh, really, really significant in different cells in our body. Okay, so that's where we're at. And um, how are we doing? We're doing great. Uh, we have another 10 minutes still, so we're doing great. So here's an example of uh, receptor tyrosine kinase, and um, it's and it's this receptor tyrosine kinase that uh, regulates a response. And uh, in this case, we want to look. So the first one, right, we learn about is RAS that can act that can regulate elk and MYC. So here's another story. It's a different receptor tyrosine kinase. It's actually the insulin receptor family. And it's going to signal through this pathway. And it's going to lead to phosphorylation of FOXO uh, or removal of that phosphate. So that's the uh, path we showed on the first day of class. And this is where we want to learn about it in our big figure is it's involved in receptor tyrosine kinase signaling like the insulin receptor, which is a receptor tyrosine kinase, one of 58 in humans, and it works through this pathway. So is FOXO regulated by RAS? No. How does FOXO get regulated? And so now for the first time in our course, we really want to pay attention to this figure. And what we see is there's no RAS here. Instead, this molecule, and it could be insulin, and this is a different role for insulin than the one that we think about with diabetes. Insulin plays some different roles. And insulin is also a member of a gene family. And the gene family includes um, insulin-like growth factor 1 and insulin-like growth factor 2. And so these, of course, are 
paralogs that rose from gene duplication, and they're really similar. The, they bind to the insulin receptor, which is also a member of a gene family. Just a small gene family with some just some different versions. And so the insulin uh, receptor and the insulin signaling pathway has some different responses, uh, potential. And here's one of them, is this receptor tyrosine kinase gets, uh, gets a signaling molecule bound and gets activated. And it's now activated and it binds to, not RAS, but it binds to an enzyme called PI3 kinase. And it activates PI3 kinase. And PI3 kinase can, act, uh, can phosphorylate not a protein, but in this case, a molecule. And the molecule is a phospholipid, part of the cell membrane. So you've drawn phospholipids since introbiology. Here's a phospholipid bilayer. But what you haven't learned is that there are a variety of different phospholipids, and one of them is PIP, or PI, and um, that stands for phosphotidyl inositol. Phosphotidyl. Oh, I just forgot if that's an I or Y. Inositol. And you don't need to learn that whole weird word. Uh, you could just call it PI or PIP, like that. And you could see in the membrane we have a uh, phospholipid, and it already has two phosphates on it. It's called PIP2. And PI3 kinase is adding a third, and the third causes this PIP3 uh, to be active. And so that's going to activate this uh, kinase that phosphorylates AKT, and then phos it's AKT that phosphorylates FOXO. So there's our signaling pathway for regulating FOXO. And it's the second one we want to learn about, and it's in chapter 17. It's the second one we want to learn about for these receptor tyrosine kinases. So, you know, we have some different examples of those, and they can activate some different pathways. Yep, the RAS pathway. Yep, the PI3 kinase pathway. And then we have another one. Okay, so that's what we're looking at and learning about in chapter 17 is we're filling in this um, um, a chart that I made, right? Okay, so uh, here we go talking more about receptor tyrosine kinases. So uh, you can see, and there are several sections of the book to describe receptor tyrosine kinases. So here's a receptor kin tyrosine kinase. It's inactive because there's no ligand, and this could be the PDGF receptor and PDGF, or it could be ERB and the EG epidermal growth uh, factor because uh, 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 it's also called the epidermal growth factor receptor, or this could be insulin or ILGF1 or 2, like that. There are several other molecules that bind their appropriate uh, corresponding uh, receptor tyrosine kinase receptor. It gets activated, and it's a kinase. And what this receptor does is it phosphorylates itself. It's said to autophosphorylate. So in the presence of the ligand, uh, receptor tyrosine kinases undergo autophosphorylation. And the phosphorylated form of the receptor is the active form. It can be inactivated by an enzyme. Remember, all kinases have a opposing action that's catalyzed by a phosphatase. So it can be inactivated. When it's active, it becomes a binding site. Oh, and this is just the chemistry of the reaction of a kinase in general. So there's a target molecule that's a substrate, and the other substrate is ATP. And the, uh, one of the phosphates from ATP is used, give, giving the products to be ADP, and then a phosphorylated a protein. And uh, receptor tyrosine kinases are called that because they always phosphorylate um, uh, proteins on amino acids that are tyrosine. So here's a phosphatase removing that phosphate and inactivating. Okay, great. So in the human genome, 
there are almost 500 genes that code for kinases. And a kinase is an enzyme that adds equivalent bond phosphate to specific target molecules. Let's think of some kinases that we know. All of the receptor tyrosine kinases are these kinases. So there are about 500 total kinases. 58 of them are receptor tyrosine kinases. Then here's another kinase we just learned about today, and we'll learn a little bit more about it, Jack kinase. So again, oops, over to our drawing, right? Uh, this Jack is one of the 500 kinases, like that. And over here, uh, we learned that RAS activates RAF, MEC, and ERK, and they're all kinases. ELK is not a kinase. It's a substrate for a kinase. ERK is a kinase that phosphorylates ELK, and ELK is the target. Um, the, um, uh, the same is true for STAT. STAT is not a kinase. It's a target of kinase. SMADs are not kinases. They're targets of kinases. FOXO, target of kinase. Who phosphorylates FOXO? AKT. So AKT is one of these about 500 kinases. Right? So, um, uh, so that's that. And then this just shows that, oh, here we have an activated uh, receptor tyrosine kinase. gets phosphorylated. That becomes a binding site for signaling molecules. And so a protein binds like this, and uh, it then is going to bind to RAS. And so we see that here, that here we have the growth factor. The ligand is present. We're activating a receptor. Maybe it's PDGF receptor. PDGF receptor autophosphorylates and uh, binds to this uh, adapter protein that then binds to RAS and activates RAS. Okay, great. Oops. And, um, and, you know, leads to a downstream phosphorylation of ERK and activates ERK, like that, okay? <coughs> Here's the book talking about RAS, yay RAS. And it shows RAS is always bound to GDP or GTP. It gets activated, and when it gets activated, the GDP is released and a GTP is bound. And when RAS is bound to uh, GTP, it's active, and then it eventually will catalyze the destruction of, or the hydrolysis of GTP down back to GDP, and it's inactivated. And that enzyme that does that job is RAS. In chapter 17, it describes there's a helper protein that binds to RAS to help increase its catalytic activity. Great. Catalytic activity is here and mutations in the enzyme to inactivate it, to decrease its activated, can cause uncontrolled growth or cancer. So we've talked a lot about that. Point mutations of the RAS gene in the coding region can lead to um, um, the inability to turn itself off. So let's just look at a couple of the highlights here. So receptor tinase, tyrosine kinase RAS signaling pathway is the most frequently altered oncogenic network in cancer, with about 46% of all samples displaying alterations. RAS itself contributes to almost 30% of mutations in human cancers. Uh, there are, RAS is in a very small gene family, KRAS and NRAS and HRAS, so three, gene, three RAS genes in humans. KRAS mutations are exceedingly common in pancreatic adenocarcinomas and colorectal cancers. So see, that's what scientists and doctors are discovering, that, that this RAS can be mutated and then, then it's mutated and it participates especially in certain specific kinds of cancer. We saw that idea with the woman with kid cancer, right? That she got the translocation, PDGF, misexpressed, overexpressed, PDGF, skin cancer. That's because PDGF is a normal signaling molecule in skin health and skin growth. And I think what we're saying here is, well, this KRAS gene is normally involved in uh, the growth and health of 
<coughs> heart colon, <coughs> or, or other you know tissues, pancreas like that. And so when it's mutated, uh, it tends to be problematic in places where it plays a normal role. Here's a different family rat and RAS, and uh, we don't need to know the different uh, versions of RAS, right? If we can learn about RAS, great. But just see here that the different um, uh, paralogs of RAS play roles in some different types of cancers because they play normal, healthy roles in different locations like that. Okay, so that's a big take-home message is that there are lots of different kinds of cancer, breast cancer, skin cancer, pancreatic cancer, etc. And then within those, there are a variety of different types of skin cancer. And the type of cancer is ultimately based on the types of mutations that give rise to that cancer. Okay? So I just highlighted those like that. And then it says, although KRAS, HRAS, and NRAS share functional similarities, KRAS missense gain of function mutations tend to occur in the 12th codon. Well, those in HRS are the 61st codon. And so that's just showing the tremendous detail of understanding. Here's the RAS. It's an enzyme. It's going to catalyze the hydrolysis of GTP to GDP. And they're just saying that in this active site, this catalytic re region, the place where GTP is bound and it's going to be you know, enzymatically cleaved to GDP, uh, one of the amino acids is amino acid number 12, and that's often mutated in uh, KRAS. And another mutation is uh, in position 61, amino acid 61, and that's often mutated in HRAS and NRANS, different mutations in different paralogs leading to roles in different types of cancer. Okay, so I gotta stop this here and we'll pick it up in the second video uh, talking about H uh, or talking about RAS signaling and these receptor tyrosine kinases. We're doing great. All right, so stop. Thank you. Hang in there.